Pagu, Chapter 18, Down to the Depths of Deep Hole. Uh-oh, remember Pagu doesn't have a shell right now. That's pretty frightening. The landlady halted her wobbling on Snail Cousin's Rock. Now who would that be, whizzing by her so fast? He pretty nearly upset Traveling Tower, he did. Headed for Muscle Ridge, looks like. If he doesn't slow up, Deep Hole is waiting next. Last stop for rash young hermits like him. Oh well, here today, gone tomorrow. Landlady or no landlady, Pagu did not fall headlong into the Deep Hole, that is, not at first. The hermit gang had given up chasing him, so he slowed to a stop on Muscle Ridge. Right here, he had studied his first muscles. He first had climbed a barnacle, and over there at the edge of the rock, the purple starfish had crept up towards him out of Deep Hole. Deep Hole. What was his, his fear of? Pagu crawled to the brink, braced himself on a lacy front, and peered down. One thing not needed on this jittery moment was Big Head, the sculpin. Yet here he came, swooping, trailing bubbles, aiming straight for Pagu. Those horrible jaws! Pagu had passed through that gateway before, in and out. Now he's about to be gulped again. This time he might have to stay inside. The awful mouth coming to him seemed to yawn wider than Deep Hole itself. Pagu, flat on the lacy flan, clutched at one edge with two feet and a claw. Leg muscles twitching in terror, his legs jerked him right under the edge and dangled him from the frond as Big Head swished over. Against the blue blackness of Deep Hole, the head-heavy fish with the tapering tail looked like a plane, a plane overshooting its target. It banked, it rolled, it returned full throttle, but where was that juicy little hermit? The goose lacy frond was a dead section of an eating bush, a bryozone. His frantic dodging had snapped the stem off like a stick of candy. The brittle lace Pagu dangling from flopped over and over like a leaf zigzagging down into the depths of deep hole. Big Head slowed, twisted his body, and followed the branch down. His fidgety tail and pitchfork fids kept working its jerks, waiting for the hanging Pagu to swing into range. But his timing was off as he charged the frond on a wrong turn, and Pagu let go just as Big Head struck. The sculpin scooped up a mouthful of stuff as crumbly as plaster, while Pagu, losing his parachute, dropped like a stone. Big Hair near the surface was still groping about in a flurry of torn lace when Pagu struck bottom far below. It was a soft mud bottom, Handy for landing in and digging under backwards. Pagu dug. Disgusted, Big Head vanished to high tide, higher tide pools. When he did not return, Pagu raised himself from the mud. So this was Deep Hole he had dreaded. With Big Head gone, what was left to dread? Pagu noticed the muscles were larger here, as if to go with the larger muscles. He saw a whopping big starfish tube-footing his way across the bare sea bottom. Starfish were old stuff to Pagu, yet he jerked into the mud again when a shadow moved in the weeds. Nope, said old Sin, sticking at his elbow. Don't you fear that, Moray Eel. He looks horrible, but he's nearsighted and doesn't bother hermits. Morays are after that thing with the long arms you haven't seen yet, but you'll know soon enough. Now stay put, son, he said, chattering on. This time pass by so slowly. Old instinct had become quite boring. Stay put, he advised, but Pagu left. He squeezed himself up from the sticky mud, plowed a furrow across it with a great, into a great standing rock, and began cleaning himself. He scrubbed and he rubbed and he whisked with bristles, and he came out fresh and new again. He had just brushed the nub of a knee with its final polish when one under an eye showed him a shell. Watch out, called instinct, but Pagoo smothered the call. From beyond the shell lay another and another, a path of snail shells leading around the base of a rock. Pagu dropped his cleaning brushes and all his cautious, and he trailed those shells like a hound after a rabbit around a rock to heaps of shells. Shades of grotto-eating trees 
He found a new grotto, a cave dented under the base of rock. Only this time the shells lay not in the hollow, but out in the open for him to examine. As though something had pushed them out of the cave just for him, they lay outside like a motionless wave of hard, bubbling f- froth. Pagoo waded into that crisp froth. The shells rolled every which way. Pagu stood up to his upper knees in treasure, busy as busy, trying them on for size. This one, no. That one, no. That over there, the black one, the turban with the sparkly, pearly top. Oh, he did like that one. This time he made sure there were no hidden holes before he stepped in. Snug, perfect. It was that bright ending to Pagu, the elegant finishing touch. Finishing touch is right, son. I've been trying to tell you something. Yes, I know you needed that show. Your fool's luck won't hold much longer. Scoot! Pagoo gave a little heat. He was sleepy. Daylight was being turned off upside. The big round sun had gone out as usual. Layers of darkness were settling down in deep pole, and tiny twinkling lights of the sea were coming on. Far up on the surface, luminous flecks were dancing. Further down, weed fronds waved sparklers. Tired, Pagoo merely glanced at the fireworks and turned towards the cave. He had a very busy day. He would just walk into this quiet cave. But what was in there? He saw a faint glow at the back, becoming a shape like a great pale moon in a midst, a monstrous egg in a nest of long, pale, ropey, wiggly things. Pamuku moved sideways so slowly, he seemed not to move at all. He edged into a dark crack. He pushed his shell far back. He stuffed himself further back in his shell. He strained backwards. He didn't want to look out, but of course his eyes would not shut. Those pale, wriggly things out there were tentacles. Old instinct did not have to shout, Pagoo knew. Deep hold held an ancient enemy of hermits. This octopus.